this uh, I think it's time to 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 start this uh, this webinar and uh, first I would like to uh, to thank you, thank you, thank you. To, to attend it and uh, just some information that uh, if you have any, when during the presentation you can submit your question there is a uh, on the bottom of the screen, or maybe on the top side, it depends on the, the computers. You have, uh, you can submit your question to the Q and A uh, tab. Okay. Also, I want wanted to say those who feel more comfortable to ask the question in Spanish or in French. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have the capacity to uh, to 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 translate them and to understand them. So don't worry, you can you can do it. And also for for your information, the recorded version of this webinar will be available on the World Potato Congress uh, website. Okay, we'll give you more information about it. Okay. So today, uh, uh, I'm I'm Andre Debo speaking at the moment, and with uh, Peter Van der Zag, we are going to present the Declaration of Dublin that was which was launched last year at the World Potato Congress in Dublin, and is now an important component of the World Potato Congress strategy to foster partnership for addressing challenges in global food security okay so the, the pre we have we have, we have organized the the presentation you can see the the outline i will start presenting the uh, giving you some information about the the, the world potato congress also presenting you the rationale of the declaration of dublin then will uh, peter will continue giving the, an, an example of china that implemented a national strategy for poverty alleviation through partnership and potato science with the government with government support and then we'll give you a few examples of the scope of the declaration of uh, of dublin following the world potato congress in ireland uh, in 2022 when the the declaration of Dublin was launched, and we will finish with uh, some concluding uh, uh, observations. So, about the, the World Potato Congress, the World Potato Congress uh, started was launched uh, in uh, 1993, which is uh, 30 years ago already. Wow, in Charlottetown, in Prince Edward Island, in uh, in Canada. Since the main objective at that time was the organization of the uh, those Global Potato Congress. And since then, 11 congresses were organized all over the world, gathering more than 10,000 potato professionals. The World Potato Congress also uh, uh, is uh, implementing a uh, webinar like we, we do it today, also has a networking event focusing on northern and southern uh, countries. You can find more information on the World Potato Congress on the on the website, and you have the uh, the address here on the the bottom of the of the page. We would like uh, to thank our sustaining partners. That uh, here you have a list of the sustaining partners on the screen, who are organized according to their level of contribution from platinum, gold, and silver sustaining partners. Those sustaining partners provide funding to support the World Potato Congress uh, operation and including the potato congresses that uh, no, I know organize every two years. That brings me to the next uh, slide. And uh, as I was saying, the, the, the first, the, the World Potato Congress was uh, launched in Charlottetown in 1993, 30 years ago in, the, uh, in Canada. Then the next time the, there was the meeting was organized in Navigate in the, in the UK. Then we had a meeting in Durban, in South Africa. Then we came back to Europe in uh, in Amsterdam. Then there was a meeting. Uh, uh, the World Potato Congress organized a congress in uh, in China in Kunming, followed by a meeting in uh, Idaho in Boise. Then there was a meeting in Christchurch in uh, in uh, in New Zealand. That was in two thousand nine. I remember because I had the opportunity to attend it. Then following by Edinburgh in uh, in Scotland. Then coming going back to China in Yankin, followed by the, the, the meeting in Cusco that was in 2018. And then we were supposed to have the meeting in Ireland in 2021, but because of the COVID pandemic, it was postponed to uh, 2022, which was uh, last year. That was the last uh, the last uh, the last congress. And now, as you have seen already when starting the, 
this the and you if you came early looking at the screen the next uh, world potato congress we are will be organized in australia in adelaide in june uh, to the uh, 2024 okay so about uh, the the declaration of uh, of dublin the power of uh, potato based food system and important to ensure sustainable livelihood through potato science and technology to feed an, an expanded population and nutrition product to consumer while minimizing an environment uh, food footprint. So mm -hmm. this is the, the rationale of the, of the declaration of Dublin. And uh, in, in the today's world, it's very important just to find opportunities to see how we can produce more food and with uh, less, uh, less input. And as you know, agriculture growth is a key factor since most of poor people depend on agriculture. And potato is cultivated in an area where potato and malnutrition in the world are pre high prevalent, and mainly in, uh, in mon mon mountain areas. And this is why innov innovation based on potato-based science can be a significant vehicle to answer today's global challenge. So that's a, a bit, uh, again, coming back to what I said, the rationale of the, the declaration of, uh, of Dublin. So why, why potato is important? If you look at the, uh, the evolution of the potato production across, across region, and if we look here on the, on the graph, you know, uh, so the, you can see that the potato production has been increasing during the last, uh, more than the last, uh, since 61, it's already many years ago, 60 years ago. But from around 2005, the, the potato production became more important in the in southern countries, you know, especially because of the, you can see here, the increase of the potato production in Asia, here in the orange color, the increase also of potato in, uh, in Africa, in the blue color, the, the potato in Latin America has been increasing too, but not at the same level as compared to, uh, to Asia and, uh, and, uh, and Africa. But in, in Europe, the, the potato production has decreased because of the change of uh, consumption habit. And in the North America, the potato production continues to be important and uh, has been increasing uh, slightly. So you can see, so the, the, the potato has become a very important uh, food crop in, uh, in southern countries, especially in Asia and Africa. And if you talk about the, the, the food crop, the potato is the third food crop uh, around the world, uh, following wheat, rice, mm -hmm. and just above, uh, above maize. So those, those aspects show you why and how, why the potato is an important uh, vehicle to respond to the global food security challenges. So now looking at how the, the, the potato can contribute to those challenges, First, you can say that if you look on, on, on the left hand, potato is a, you can say, is a very resilient crop. It has a high yield capacity. It has a very high nutritional value too. And it's one of the key characteristics of the potato. It, it, can, it can adapt to different agri-food agri system. You can find potato at the sea level, but you can find it also at about 4,000 levels, uh, 4,000 meters altitude. You know, I've been working in the Andes and you have to 4,500 meters, you can still find potatoes uh, growing, you know? So that's, uh, okay, that, that shows its uh, adaptability. It's also a subsistence and in, an income crop because it plays a dual role for the family. First, contributing to the family farming economy as a cash crop and also providing food for home consumption. So we know, everyone, most people know that potato is very nutritious, providing energy, which is uh, very important, but not only energy, it has also, it is also a very excellent source of uh, vitamin C, potassium, dietary fiber, and also contains micronutrients such as iron and zinc. And at, at that point of view, you know that uh, deficiency, uh, iron deficiency, uh, uh, it's a problem that is found in many developing countries, creating anemia, and then following the anemia, the, especially the children are then uh, affected by other other problems. And I would just would like to mention that SIP 
has been is now is working has been working already for several years, but now has developed varieties with a higher level of uh, of iron, which can contribute to to respond to the the problem of uh, iron deficiency in many in many uh, many countries. So. Although potato is important, and I mentioned that is a, it has a high yield uh, capacity. If you look at this uh, this map showing the global uh, distribution of potato yield around the world, you know, it's uh, you, you, you can still see that uh, there is still some efforts to be done. The, you know, the countries in red, the average uh, production is uh, less than ten tons per hectare. And it's the case in well, at least in one country in in Latin America, many countries in the, in in Africa, in in Asia, most of the country uh, produce uh, between ten and twenty tons. But we have to also to be careful because uh, global averages mask dramatic differences among regions within countries. So you can have. Uh, an average which is between 10 and 20, but you know, it's in those countries too, we have areas where the, the, the yield can be lower. So much improvement is still needed to, to improve potato production. And with the declaration of Dublin, the World Potato Congress want, wants to contribute to these, uh, to these efforts. So the declaration of, of Dublin is Part of the World Potato, no, Potato World Potato Congress strategy, it's a guiding document and it's an important component of this uh, strategy. The Declaration of Dublin should contribute to strengthen the World Potato Congress key key role to foster relationship between the private and the public potato partners, promoting interaction, knowledge sharing, collaboration to invest to invest in potato driven projects in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. As part of the preparation of the Dublin uh, Declaration, the, the Irish government in uh, 2022 funded 400, four, sorry, 40 scholarships to facilitate the participation uh, to, to the World Potato Congress in Dublin to delegates uh, from Asia, Africa, South America who were involved in potato innovation and development activities addressing food security challenge. So that was an important starting point. Mm -hmm. And those uh, those partners uh, that you can see here, some of them that attended the, the World Potato Congress in, uh, in Ireland, you know, have, as I say, were involved in the, in the uh, project to, to, to respond to these uh, those challenges of food security. I know that, that some of them are contributing to the Declaration of Dublin with, with uh, their activities. And this is, so that, as I said, that was a starting point. And we would like uh, at World Potato Congress to, to, con to continue to, to develop this, uh, this type of, uh, of activities uh, around the world. And now I'm going to pass the, the floor to, uh, to, to Peter, who is going to present example of a potato uh, driven uh, project. So Peter, uh, it's up to you now. Thank you, Andre. Um, welcome everybody to this webinar. I, it's my pleasure to share this with Andre. I've known Andre for a long time. We both worked for SIP for many years and we worked together in Rwanda and we've kept contact all these years with, through SIP and now through the World Potato Congress. So a great partner to work with. So thank you, Andre. Okay. So my work um, is, is short, my presentation is the practical part of this presentation. And, and I think, but I think I should just add though that um, my personal experience goes back to when I started working in Bangladesh and working there with poverty alleviation to potatoes. And then when joining SIP and working in Rwanda in Central Africa. And then you see how it all evolved. And then later on, I was asked to start the SIP work in, in China in 1986. And poverty was very, very evident then in China. But between 2000 and between 1986 and 2010, China made impressive strides forward in developing their country. And this map here is just an example that shows, this is a picture I've taken in 2010. And it shows you uh, the prosperous 
pink colored provinces. We show it shows the the green, which are doing well, and then you show the, the blue. And my work was primarily focused in the blue area of Yunnan and Sichuan provinces. And uh, that area was definitely had poverty, and potatoes could, could grow there. And with improved germ plasm and seed production, many steps were made moving forward. But I didn't solve the problem. So uh, you have the technology, but you don't have the way to, for farmers to adopt it. So in 2011, next slide, Andre. In 2011, I was very fortunate to be invited by Chu Dong Yu, who is now the Director General of FAO. He was then the Vice Governor of Ningxia Province. And he, was a, he organized then a Congress, which was a, a, a very, they say it was the largest potato event they've ever, ever held anywhere in the world. But it was basically all Chinese people from all over the, the blue area and others who came to this Congress to address how do we alleviate poverty in China through potatoes. I was invited to be one of the speakers there. In the picture you see Chu Dong Yu and myself and the chair of the session. But the point of that, that Congress was a, a sort of the launch of a, a national program to alleviate poverty through potatoes and this required that uh, people had to be on board. Okay, next slide. So what happened then was that each, um, all the institutions, like I was with, involved with Yunnan Normal University, they had to send some of their people, had to work in villages and remote areas to help with potato production. This happened all across China. And actually, uh, the potato program in China was under the leadership of Dr. Jin Li Ping was a great motivator in this work as well. And also then beside that, uh, the rich provinces, municipalities were to link with poor municipalities in the, in the blue areas to help them with other aspects as well. Infrastructure development was done by the government. And this resulted in, this was a, a massive program to see the transformation of these poor areas with potatoes being a major component of how this was possible. I worked a lot in Shaotong, which is a part of Yunnan province. And there the party secretary for, Yun, for that Shaotong, population was around six, seven million people. He said, every morning when I wake up, I think I have to bring a thousand people out of poverty today. How will I do that? At night when I go to sleep, I asked the same question, Did I was I successful today bringing a thousand people out of poverty today? In other words, it was from the party secretary down, everybody had the same conscience of working together through partnerships to help alleviate poverty. Now this was a big success. This work was a strong focus and uh, this resulted in improved data production all through the mountain areas with improved seed, improved varieties, improved technologies, and this was made possible through all these partnerships. Next slide. Then comes the problem of suddenly you have too much, too many potatoes, and um, not enough, uh, not enough market. So at the at the Congress in Yanqing, the World Potato Congress in Yanqing in 2015, one of the major events of that Congress was that China was going to make potato the fourth staple food of China. That was a major, major uh, event, a uh, strong um, commitment from all levels of government, uh, from both the federal, the national government plus the local governments. And there we, they made a plan uh, that was well publicized that it was to be a staple food. Now, what does that mean? That most institutions, like I was at the uni university, that the dishes that were served for lunch to all the students and to the staff and faculty always had three or four or five potato dishes. And potatoes were promoted in many different ways. And I'm just showing you a few pictures here of potato as a, they call it a spaghetti potato, which you can have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You have potatoes as an extender of rice, which you see in the right top picture. You can have it fried, like in the lower. And you can even see the industry of French fry development and chip development in China has also grown rapidly. But this was all 
because again, a government program to make potato a staple food. And this has together driven the, the progress forward. And officially, I think China said in 2019 that poverty had been alleviated. There's still work to be done, of course, in rural areas, but this was an amazing success. Shea Kayun and Churong Yu together wrote a cookbook about potatoes, how to cook potatoes. That was well publicized and well used. And many, many recipes were created that were beyond what I'm showing you here, which people used uh, and are still using today as a way to, to promote potatoes. So this is a, a huge example I'm, I'm sharing with you, which is basically an in-country example with some support from, from foreign agencies with germplasm, et cetera. But basically it was a China-driven program. So now I wanna share with you from that experience and Andre, next slide. Andre already showed you this picture, but the, the main issue we have in the world today is that even within the, the orange color or the green color, there is a disparity as between what some farmers get for yield and others get for yield. And that's because of economic situations, climatic conditions, varieties that aren't right, diseases that are present. So how can we address those issues? And that's what the Dublin Declaration came, Declaration of Dublin came into effect. How can we foster relationships between experts and partners who can help alleviate those constraints to make production better? So today, there, on the website now, you'll find nine recent stories from people who attended the Congress in Dublin who have written about their partnerships and how they've helped improve potato production in their area. Today, I, I will only share with you four that I think are different in their way they were done and highlight the, the, the diversity of ways this, this declaration can be implemented. So the first one I wanna share with you is from, from, uh, from Nepal. Now Nepal has been a favorite country of, uh, of the Swiss. This, uh, both, both are mountain countries. I've enjoyed going to Nepal myself. And of course the Kathmandu Valley is famous for potatoes, and that's where the most population is as well. But the remote areas of, of the country are very hard, to, um, hard to, uh, to get to. So this is a project that was launched by the National Potato Program with funding, which was given by the Swiss Development Corporation. SIP provided the germplasm, and SIP, in fact, even had people based there at one time. And with a research station at the far east of the country, that uh, requested assistance with improving potato production for their area, both for consumption, as well as as seed to be sold to the lowlands, the Tarai area that goes down towards the, the lower elevation during the winter season for dryland potato production. So this is an example of a project that was, that's been in the, in the making, but the, the research station in Elam is the one that really started to work, make it happen. And what was the impact? Well, the SIPs introduced germplasm and some of these varieties did very well. And they selected one variety called Janek Dev. That variety was the preferred one for late bite resistance and high yield. They got tissue culture plants from Kathmandu that are pathogen free. They multiplied those and they grow the seed in the highlands like you see in the picture above. And then the seed is then sold to the lowland areas and the large ones in other potatoes are kept for human home consumption. And this is an example of uh, a targeted area in the far east of the country where three partners together help make this possible under the real leadership of the National Potato Research Program. So this is an example that uh, I think is amazing for how in Asia especially, this kind of work has, has grown very rapidly and success has been achieved at many levels throughout, not only in Nepal, but also in India and other countries as well. So Benot, Benot Passad was at the Congress. In fact, he gave me some tea that I've enjoyed almost for a whole year. And it's been a pleasure to work with him on this Nepal story and his work there. And now in Nepal, also they're now looking at using apical rooted cuttings to rap more rapidly multiply their clean cutting material, which they learned at the Congress in Dublin from the Filipino people who were there at the Congress. So this kind of exchange of ideas and technologies happened in Dublin that's helping Vinod and his people in Nepal. Let's now move to uh, 
to Uganda. I meet Anna. Anna, Anna was very present at the meetings in Dublin. She made herself, she was always dressed very elegantly as a, with her native beautiful dress on. And she's a large, big woman. So she could, she was everywhere you could see and talk to her. And she was made herself known and she was very good at getting, developing new relationships with many people. And she leads a women's group or a whole farmer's association in Zombo and a dynamic leader. And she's been very fortunate with Trias. Trias is a Belgian NGO supported by farmers in Belgium. And this is a rather large NGO that works in numerous countries, including in Uganda with staff based there as well. And Trias has been wonderful as far as not only supporting Anna in her work, but also linking Anna with other agencies like the ones listed below, credit unions and training institutes for the national government programs to help the whole program in, in uh, Anna's district to be improved. So it, again, it's one large NGO working with subgroups of people to support a comprehensive program for potato production in that area as well as other crops. Next slide. So it's really a, a broad-based approach, okay? And uh, potatoes just is one component of it. And so you see they work on storages, on irrigation, on soil improvement, on seed production. So this is the kind of strategy that they've had there, which is a holistic and very impactful. So Anna was not only in Dublin, but she also went into Belgium and again, developed more linked linkages with people that could help her with her work back in Uganda. So the Congress in Dublin was a great um, place for her to really get more uh, support and attention. And now this story could be published about her work to be shared with others around the world to see it as an example of how this program has been launched and worked so effectively. Next slide, Andre, thank you. Now we go to Kenya. Now this is a bit of a different story. In Kenya, we have, um, Kenya is, 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 is the second most important food crop in Kenya already. And here we have a, a company, which is Fresh Crop LTD, which is actually owned by Chris and Ashley Kaspari, who are American citizens. Ashley actually grew up in Kenya. So she's more or less a Kenyan native as well. And she met Chris and Chris and her together started this farm near where she grew up. And uh, this farm is called Fresh Crop. And um, they had a vision for helping with seed potato production in their area of, of, uh, of Kenya. And so how do you make this happen? So first, of course, they had to learn themselves. And then they had to find partners who were willing to help them. And they, their partners are primarily financial, local banks. And uh, this Dutch NGO, SNV, these are the partners that sort of helped them launch. And then people from SIP and others have given them technical support that they together then launched the seed potato production program. And their focus there with this focus of this story is on mechanization. And how does mechanization impact production in a, in a country where there's, where there's food insecurity? So Chris and Ashley came to Dublin. Chris was sponsored by the as a bursary, Ashley came on her own. And they met many people there and talked to many people, especially about mechanization. And they met with different companies about what they could purchase, what was suitable as far as adaptable to their conditions back in, um, in Kenya. So with that, they came back to Kenya and then with, winning to, with having to go to banks to borrow money, they bought a homemade planter, which as you see in the first picture, the orange planter or yellowish planter. They got a Grimmy uh, Hiller, the top right picture. They bought a Turkish lifter, potato lifter. So you see, they were able to, through the Congress in Dublin, make all these connections to find different pieces of equipment that they could use that were suitable for them and bring them to uh, import them and bring them to uh, be used on their farm. So the farmers, are, the people at the staff are learning how to use them and it's been very beneficial. Next slide. 
So, and, the, and then the bottom slide is a picture of, the, of their harvester. They bought this harvester from a company in, in England, uh, also through, through the, the Congress in Dublin. And uh, here they are now mechanized their, their farming operation to a, a large extent. They could expand production. But besides that, they also do field days for training, for training people. They host international visitors from all over Africa, especially. And that they have been very successful as far as being a model farm. That when they have their field day, they get up to 5,000 people come to their field days to see what they're doing. So this shows you the interest of this kind of a, a model farm that is being that has other supporters who work with them, both at the at the at the pro bono level as well as who they have to buy things from, like equipment. And this has been a great story of how one private entrepreneur in his group with a big heart can impact the whole community, a larger community. Next slide. But there is a challenge. And this is what one thing that uh, I, I talked to Chris and Ashley about this quite a bit. It says, how does mechanization impact your communities? How will this affect people who have no work? How will, how will this affect your acceptance into a community if you displace people with machinery? So Chris writes this, and this is, I think, very important. It is crucial to work within the social context and not eliminate casual labor jobs that have been a pillar for employment. This is another reason we are using a stepwise approach to introducing mechanization and keep good relations with the community. Mechanization allows us to expand production without our eliminating our labor force. Instead, we repurpose roles as we continue to expand. And I think this is very important to be sensitive as you live as a community how you make this happen in a way that you don't alienate the people in the community and you allow the whole community to prosper together and be part of it, be the success story, as well as um, the entrepreneur, so to speak, that the whole community is improved through this work. So very exciting work that they're doing. Um, they were recently in Canada and visited our farm and visited a, a trade show. This may be a little bit of a plug for Sputnik, but this, they were looking at bigger equipment, but this won't work on their, their situation. Next slide. <clears throat> my last one, my last example here is from, uh, is from Yemen. And Yemen is an example of a story that is kind of interesting. Mohammed didn't make it to Dublin, but Mohammed was uh, persistent in keeping contact with people like myself and Dr. Monica Parker from SIP, who was then based in Nairobi. So Mohammed um, is a professor at a university in the Dahamar University, but also there's a Dahamar Valley, which is a beautiful valley where they can, they can grow potatoes. And so the, the company that has a seed production business, Abdul Allah uh, has this business, him and Mohammed worked together with Monica and myself to start this collaborative work together. Which, so the partners are kind of strange, right? It's individuals um, and myself with our institute working together to help this country. Next slide. You have to understand that Yemen has been a, a, is a war-torn country. It has been destroyed by the war that's gone on now for a long time. It's still not totally settled. Basically, the country's bankrupt. There's no money to buy for foreign exchange. The country is it's one of the large highest levels of mal malnutrition in the world is in Yemen. And right now, Yemen has no money to import seed from Europe. And so the question is, how do you address food security in a country like that? So this is what Monica Parker, myself, with Mohammed and others have been trying to address this issue. So very we're very fortunate. Next slide. <clears throat> that uh, we were able to first work with what they had. And we had experiments and production of second and third generation seed potatoes that were imported from before. And looking at virus levels and irrigation management, how can we improve their production with what they have now at seed? And this was, we, we talked we did a lot of work with roguing to get rid of plants that weren't good, better storage. And really Mohammed and his team there have done a wonderful job of working with the farmers. And uh, you can see from the picture how, how primitive things are with mules doing the hilling and camels doing the hilling and plowing. But uh, this is the way it is now still in Yemen today. 
Next slide. But the main story comes next. So we we're very fortunate that Monica Parker and SIP in uh, Nairobi agreed to host a delegation of people from Yemen to come there to study agriculture and potato farming in Kenya. In fact, they even visited fresh crop, which we just showed the previous slide, previous example. And they, there we worked together to, uh, they were able to bring back 12 SIP potato varieties as tissue culture plants. And these were multiplied in tissue culture back in Yemen in a special lab. And then those plants were taken to the university and here they are growing in two different locations as apical cuttings. These are, these are all cuttings taken from plants that were transplanted to the field. And here you see it, the top picture shows some of the 12 clones that were being grown. The bottom picture shows the plants at a further advanced stage. And in fact, yes, yesterday, Mohammed was harvesting some of these clones with some very good yields already. And the variety Unica, which some of you may know, was one of the best ones, interestingly enough. But anyway, so this program is now with apical rooted cuttings. We hope to have a new revolution in, in Yemen of growing potatoes in this way that will totally um, become, make them self-sufficient and have the right varieties that will grow in the right conditions to meet their needs. And this is a very exciting program that the government is very excited about, and very supportive of Mohammed and the whole team. Frequent visits both to the research stations and to the farmers' fields where these are being grown to see what's happening and to talk about this as how to move this forward quickly. Next slide. So in conclusion of this, my presentation here at this part, um, I just sent you, I'll give you four examples. And there's actually nine right now that were recently published on the website, how we have different kinds of partnerships that can make this happen. Whether it's a government like our Swiss Development Corporation, whether it's a large NGO like Trias, whether it's an entrepreneur with a big heart like what you saw with Fresh Crop, whether it's SIP who has been actively all over the world and Andre and I both have many experiences with SIP, whether it's an institute like my own institute here in, in Ontario, Canada, and local government organizations. Uh, uh, many, many countries can't do what China did the, of their level of prosperity, but local governments can do a lot to encourage and support this as well. So all of these are examples. And as I, as I conclude my part here, I want you to think about how could we partner, how can we make partnerships that may be relevant to your predicament or situation, whether you could be on the support side or the receiving side, how can we make this happen under, under very different contexts? The Declaration of Dublin is open to allow many different permutations to take place. So with that, I'll go to the concluding slide. So there's a lot of discussion about what does the Declaration of Dublin actually mean? So it's not a financial commitment to any specific project. Our organization is a global organization. We have a global commitment to share knowledge and provide networking opportunities for implementing and supporting projects through Congress events, through webinars, through contacts with key potential partners or donors. And I just gave you those examples. These, those partnership projects and their achievements can be made visibly, visible globally and promoted through the WDC. And the around the globe section of our website is where you can look to see both the declaration in full, as well as the stories that we have published up to date. So with that, I want to say thank you for your interest. And I think now we're open for our Q&A section. And Andre and I'll take turns answering the questions. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. And, uh... For those uh, giving those examples, so let's go through the through the picture. And the, well, the first question was, uh, how can you support poor country like Yemen? I think you gave uh, already a good example and uh, and part of, part of the uh, part of the uh, of the answer. There is another question uh, asking, what is the difference between seed potato seed variety and European potato seed? You know, well, I can start responding to that uh, to that question. 
uh, but the European potato seed, you know, they are selected in under European conditions, and and usually they respond to very specific uh, market segment. You, you have varieties that uh, mm -hmm. are very good for potato processing. You have varieties that are very good for production. You have varieties that uh, you can say eventually are, are in are in between. But uh, and also they are selected under the uh, the Euro European condition, which are long day condition, which sometimes it's also important depending on which country you they are going to be to be used. While sea potato varieties uh, varieties normally uh, are selected uh, by SIP and, and responding to the local agroecological condition, giving emphasis to uh, uh, pest and disease uh, resistance to yield. You know, so I think these are the main, uh, the main uh, objective because seed potato varieties normally respond to the food security uh, challenges. So to be able to respond to those challenges, uh, uh, pest and disease resistance are very, very important. Yield is very important. And uh, so I think this is the, the, main, the main difference. What I have observed also, because, you know, in, in many countries uh, uh, in, in the South, you know, the the, the demand for uh, processing variety is increasing. What what I have observed that uh, uh, it's important to at the end to be able to select varieties that uh, what we call are dual purpose varieties that uh, they respond to the food security needs. They, they produce well and they are re resistant to pest and disease, but also they have characteristics that uh, are acceptable by the uh, by the processing companies. You know that's. But that this is still something that needs to be to be developed, and uh, this is a point that at the moment we are discussing with with the, the breeder how to adjust to that situation. So I think this is the the it is the way I would like to answer. I don't know, Peter, if you want to complement uh, about that question. Well, I think I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and answer the next question, Andre. Yeah. What are what are the advantages for planting potatoes in the highlands? Well, I'm not sure there's an advantage, maybe it's a disadvantage. I often said, I wish I worked on rice. It's so easy to travel from the capital city and airport to the rice fields. But to travel from the capital city to any potato fields, it takes a long trip on bad roads. And uh, so, but the highlands, what crops can grow there is the question. Now, in the highlands of, of Southwest China, for example, you grow barley, some flax maybe, some rapeseed, uh, you can't grow sometimes wheat. You have peas and potatoes. That's it. It's too cold for other crops, so you're somewhat limited what you can grow. And the same the same is true in the Andes of, of South America. So potatoes are, are a very good crop to grow in the highlands, but generally the highlands are also wet. And the problem with the wetness is they have the, the late blight, and the late blight is the biggest challenge we face in the highland tropics. And in the, whether it's the Philippines or Indonesia or Southwest China or you go to East Africa, uh, just those examples, late blight. And I think the SIP germplasm, what Andre is talking about, has developed much better germplasm for resistance to late blight. Now, the, 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 the adaptation is also a short day versus long day. The varieties also make a big, big difference. European varieties will mature very early under short day conditions of the tropics. Uh, the variety Unica, which is now being grown all over the world almost, it's, it's amazing how it's almost a day neutral variety, does very well in many different climates and day lengths. So one of the problems we face, this goes back to the question, uh, seed production. And the whole issue of apical rooted cuttings from tissue culture plants, which you will read the stories on the website, uh, earlier stories are all about apical rooted cuttings in Kenya and other places. That has been a, a good way to rapidly multiply new SIP varieties quickly for use by farmers on a larger scale. Before you, they, for example, in Vietnam, we introduced some SIP varieties back after the war and they said, we want some seed. And we said, there is no seed. So you have to make your own seed. So that's when the whole revolution of tissue culture plants, producing apical cuttings, producing tubers, many tubers, and then multiplying those very rapidly was how seed production became a new strategy with using the, the tissue culture plants and cuttings. So this is the real challenge, I think, even like in Nepal, now they said, yes, we want to do that, what you're doing in the Philippines. We want to adopt that same strategy now in Nepal as well. So 
this is a new area. For example, the last story on the website uh, from 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 uh, from Uganda is from a family doing tissue culture and cuttings and selling their sea potatoes to not only Uganda but also to Congo and Rwanda, even with the variety Kinigi, which comes from Rwanda originally to Uganda. So this is how it's all sort of evolving, and it's very exciting to be part of this. Yeah, thank, thank you, Peter. And, and also maybe just complementing the question of what is the advantages of planting potato in the highland. You know, I, I've been working in the Andes and normally what farmers are doing, you know, is, uh, an, um, is uh, in the higher altitude, you have less, less, uh, less insects that can transmit viruses, you know? And so they normally, they produce their seed in the higher, higher altitude, you know, and then they, then they use it in the lower altitude. So that's a uh, highland is also a way to, uh, to get, uh, I would say, uh, more favorable conditions to, uh, to, 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 to produce and select your, your seed. So that's another argument that we could give about uh, the, the advantages of planting potato in the highland, yeah? Then there was another question for Sahart to Labi, uh, asking, do you support studies on the nutritional value of potatoes? And again, this is where I think uh, the World Potato Congress can play an important role about the partnership because the World Potato Congress doesn't implement any studies on, the, on, on nutritional value, but can link you to research institute or to, to with the, the the International Potato Center. As I mentioned in my presentation, since SIP has been working already since several years in the selection of uh, potato varieties which are more nutri nutritious and giving spe specific in, uh, um, specific emphasis on micronutrient like uh, iron especially, but also looking at zinc. But iron is the the main. Uh, the main aspect, and as I, I was explaining, the iron deficiency is prevalent in many uh, many area uh, uh, where potato is grown, and the iron deficiency creates anemia, and then affect the health of the children. So, improving the level of iron iron in potato varieties can contribute to respond to the the problem of uh, of anemia. And uh, I've been uh, involved in, in a project in, uh, for example, in, in the Andes in Peru, where we started to, to promote this type of varieties. And I know that SIP now uh, has already released some varieties, and I think there is some gem plasma available that should be. Should be. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, uh, you could contact SIP, or we could help you to get in touch with SIP to, 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 to see the possibility to access this type of, uh, of uh, genetic ma material, OK? And, and Peter, we come back to to Unica, and there is a question: yeah. What is the what? Where is where was Unica developed? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the Unica is a very it's actually a very unique variety. Uh, it was developed in Peru by SIP. It was adapted to basically day neutral conditions on, in, on the coast of Peru. Uh, am, I, am I right, uh, Andre? On the coast. Yes, that's correct. Uh, on, the, on the coast, right. So in a lowland area in Peru. And from there, it first, first, I think one of the first places where it was adopted was in northwest China at 40 degrees north latitude. And here it grows in Qinghai province. It grows very well. They, named it, they gave it a different name there, but it's the same variety. It now grows through all, lot, lots of parts of China. You go to Kenya, it grows in parts of uh, East Africa. And the Mohammed just finished harvesting his experiment in uh, in uh, in Yemen, and there it is there as well. So it's one of these very unique varieties that has wide adaptation. It has some very good qualities, very strong, good yields. Its processing ability is not not so good, but for human consumption, it, it's it's a fine potato. So it's kind of a unique variety that I've talked about before as well. That it's such a wide adaptation, which is an exception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and Peter, I'll leave I'll leave you with the next question too because I know you are more involved in that than me. Do you see technologies like hybrid true potato seed and new breeding techniques shaping potato production? Absolutely, and uh, this is this is going to be the next revolution. Apical root cuttings are the present revolution of how we do seed production. 
the next one will be the hybrid potato seed of diploid potatoes. I just attended a, a meeting in China where this, we talked about this and it's being launched now as a global alliance. Rwanda and Kenya have joined. SIP has joined with China. And we are together now going to start developing uh, strategies for how Rwanda and Kenya can do these experiments with these new materials that are diploid hybrid true seed. So at the end of the day, what we visualize is that we don't no longer plant tuber seed. We'll plant botanical seed, that's like the tomato seeds, and they will either be pelleted and transplanted or grown directly through seed, a seed drill into the field. And this is, uh, with the diploid potato, you have only two alleles, so two, two, uh, two copies of every trait. So when you make a cross, you can be more specific in targeting what traits you want to bring into your, your new, your new um, your, your, your hybrid. So this is this is very helpful to get uniform offspring by inbreeding first, then crossing. And I think um, Dr. Wang Sao Wen, who was really the, the leader of this work in China, he has a vision this is gonna take place very soon. Five to 10 years from now, we'll see this having a major impact in many parts of the world. So I'm involved with this. And I think the next Congress in, in Adelaide, we're gonna have a side event on this very topic as well. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, uh, the next question, I, I'm, uh, I'm quite, I would say, pleased to see that uh, we have uh, <laughs> somebody from the Okara Potato uh, Cooperative Society contacting us because just, you know, I've been working in Pakistan that's already, we're looking back, it's 40 years ago, I think. And I used to work with the, um, the Okara Cooperative Society in the promoting the development of new varieties and seed production. And at that time, uh, just for um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Maksud Hamjad, just want to let you know with the, with the vice president at that time, I was in touch with Dr. Ijaz. I don't know if Dr. Ijaz is still around, but uh, at least that was the, the contact I had. And uh, so good to be in touch with you. And uh, so when you say it requested to arrange complementary arrangement visa traveling hotel food, I don't, are you talking about the participation to the, uh, I assume participation to the, uh, the World Potato Congress. So for your information, you need to follow on the, uh, the World Potato Congress uh, website and uh, newsletter because normal, what we are going to, what the World Potato Congress is planning to do for the next uh, event that will take place in Australia with the government of Australia is to provide a scholarship for to facilitate the participation of uh, of uh, people and who, who don't who don't have the the, the 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 capacity and the resources to to attend those congress. So we 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 did that in in Ireland and we were able to provide forty scholarship, you know, with the support of the government of uh, Ireland, and we hope to be able to repeat the same process with the government of uh, of uh, of Australia. So those be, won't be full scholarship, but there, there will be a partial scholarship to, to support people who are interested to, to participate. So you need to keep in touch through the World Potato Congress website or, or getting uh, uh, registered to get the newsletters. Okay, so that's, Peter, I don't know if you want to add something about that. Yeah, that's good. I just said, I'll answer the next one, Andre, which is a long question, long question, but it's basically about potato storage. Yeah, and I think this, me, maybe just in between, Mr. Sahar Tulabi is asking how he can he can get in touch for getting more information about uh, uh, clones or gemplas with a uh, nutritional value. Uh, what would be the best way uh, to connect with the with the World Potato Congress? And we can take take it. You can send a message, uh, or to I SIP, maybe to SIP directly. Yeah, but if you don't have the but you can you can do it through SIP or uh, maybe we can help you also if you contact the World Potato Congress. I can help you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Potato storage is very important, but at the same time, you know, in most of the, the tropical world, uh, depends where you are, of course. Uh, if you have a seasonal crop like in South in the, in the in the dry season of India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, cold storage is used for storage, right? But many other parts of the, of the highland tropics, potato production is almost all year round. 
And storage is important, of course. And uh, but marketing and short-term storage and marketing is very important to get to avoid having gluts, but also to have a, an even supply on the market at the right price. For example, in Kenya, with the variety Shangi, which has no dormancy, it becomes a bit more tricky because it's a variety you have to sort of sell after harvest because it will start to sprout right away. So generally in Kenya, you, you eat potatoes all year round, and you can harvest all year round, so it's okay. But it, it does become a challenge when you have storage issues. Now storage, uh, what level of storage is possible? Again, it depends on funding and what you can, what you can afford to uh, build as far as with, with uh, cooling systems and electricity and ventilation, it's not easy. So it's a very good point. For example, the, the, the project of Anna in Uganda, that is, they're doing work on developing improved simple storage facilities for short-term storage. But thank you for the reminder. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. And then we have a question from uh, Ronnie Cook. Hi, Ronnie, good, good to, to get in touch yeah. with you. It's been a long time. <laughs> that, that was in Ireland uh, last year. So your, your point about the, the China success story and the and uh, the political commitment. And uh, so your question, if if there are similar uh, situation in Africa with potato increases, depending on changing consumption habits. I don't know, Peter, if you have, uh, based on the, uh, I don't know, if you have some elements, you know Africa better than me, yeah. I would say this is this is a very tough situation because most countries in Africa don't have the means to do this. Uh, for example, Yemen, they are, what we're doing there, they're, the government's very supportive of this. Or are they coming with the financial funding and support to make it uh, large scale? Uh, they, don't have the, they, don't have, they don't have the resources. Whereas in China, you had the resources to be able to transfer from the rich parts to the poorer parts. And it was an obligation. It was like a part of your philanthropic requirements to do that. Um, I mean, when I was in Rwanda, we had a very strong commitment from the government, but it's 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 it's, it's not the same because potato also doesn't dominate the food system in the same way. Corn has been sort of the the main crop, but other crops are, I would say, equally important. So, anyway, Rodney, this is a good question to 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 sort of not bother leaders with, but to when we have meetings in in high level places to challenge them to further support this work through high level government support. I think as far as seed production and, and, and research work, that's possible, but from the point of view of the partnerships and helping communities develop, it becomes more tricky. Yeah. And maybe one aspect I'd like to, to mention because uh, you, many of you might have heard that uh, the World Potato Congress has been uh, involved with the with the FAO and some uh, uh, some some countries, you know, put, to promote the, the International Potato Day, you know. And I think the and I hope we hope that because no, it has been going through the uh, the process uh, through FAO and you know, with the UN, and it should be approved uh, the resolution to celebrate an International Potato Day on May 30th every year should also contribute to raise the visibility of the potato and to to start having uh, more incidence on uh, on policy. So, okay, that's not a direct uh, uh, effect, but I, I hope that that will contribute to, to give more visibility to potato and, and influence on uh, on policies too. So that I just wanted to mention it because uh, the World Potato Congress is very much involved in the, in the promotion of the celebration of an International Potato Day that uh, in collaboration with the FAO and some, uh, some, some, uh, some key countries who have been uh, involved in that process, including Belgium, China, Peru. Peru is the, the origin of the, the potato, Canada and Australia. Those countries have been really very active in promoting the, the celebration of the International Potato Day. So it was I, my opportunity to make some, some uh, promotion about that uh, celebration that I hope will be celebrated for the first time on the 30th of May, 2024. So let's move to the next question. Can we can we so, use? Uh, and, and, Sorry, Andre. I think we've had to we have to stop here. Um, let me just answer the second question after the, the question after that one before we close. 
Yeah. I think for all of you who are interested to come to, to the Congress in, the, in, in Adelaide, who are looking for bursary support, please write to uh, the World Bank Congress directly and submit your name. And we'll, we'll make an announcement about this uh, probably in January to, uh, to uh, indicate who and how it, will be, how it will work. But we're open to any name who wants to come. Submit your name now to the World Bank Congress in uh, head office. And we'll work with you to see what we can do to make it happen for you to be with us in Adelaide. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for all your interesting questions. For me, this is my passion. I'm excited about this work. And uh, I see this as the, as, the, as the ultimate way to have food security for all in our world is through work like this, our partnerships between those who have and those who haven't on very, very, various aspects to make this a reality. So thank you. Andre, go ahead. Yeah, no, I would like also to thank you when, when Peter talks about the passion. I think I've been working all my life uh, promoting the, the, the potato crop responding to food security. It's also very important uh, for me. So we will continue working on that. And the, the Declaration of Dublin is a, I, I would say, is a tool that the World Potato Congress would like to uh, to continue to develop and also to, for me, to enhance the collaboration also with the private sector to support all these, uh, these efforts. So, Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, okay, so I think uh, we'll uh, close here. We'll yes. close here. Yes. Okay. Thank you.